world that is sometimes underwater. And that's probably the reason why we know relatively so much more about this intertidal zone than we do about what's really out there and deeper in the ocean, right? It's more easily accessible. Um, we get these windows uh, at low tide where we can dig around and see what, um, what the bottom of the ocean looks like, at least around the edge. So imagine for a moment that you are a little crab or a periwinkle snail, and I want you to just imagine the difference in experience if you were on the outside of that rock, right? Um, verse, compare that to in this little protected tide pool over here, okay? So right now it's windy, uh, it's a gray day. Um, you can, the water is a lot calmer here, right? So depending on how big and strong of an organism you are, it might be a lot harder to, to stay stable over there. Um, and now imagine that the sun goes away and it's noon on a hot summer day. This tide pool here is gonna be, gonna heat up a lot. The water's gonna start to evaporate. That means that the, salt, the salt that's gonna be left behind is gonna concentrate. So you're gonna end up with um, in maybe like a difference of six feet from over here to here, this little tide pool, midday on a hot summer day, could be starting to dry out, really hot, high salinity, very low wave action. And that low wave action is gonna mean there's less oxygen in there, especially as that water starts to heat up and other organisms start to uh, up their respiration as well. So running out of oxygen, hot, salinity, um, super, super different environment than right next door in this other pool that's just connected to more seawater. And so that huge variability, even on the same day, uh, is one of the things that makes this rocky intertidal zone such an interesting place to study ecology, to study the interactions between organisms and their environment, between organisms and each other. So I think that's all I'm gonna do here at high tide today. Um, but I will come back in six hours at low tide um, and I will try and stand in some of the same places. Now you can see behind me that little spit of land. Um, and hopefully if I can get into the same spot at low tide, you can see the difference, right? So think about, I asked you to think about the difference between an organism, you know, six feet away in different tide pools. Um, now I want you to think uh, as I, when I come back at low tide, I want you to think about the difference between what an organism maybe down there behind me that's submerged, what they're gonna deal with now at high tide, and how different that's gonna be six hours from now at low tide. And it looks like my daughter and my mom have come to say hi. Okay, I'm back as promised. It is low tide, still windy, um, and I am walking a different way because this is low tide. Um, all of this was underwater when I was up, when we were, uh, when I was talking to you this morning. So I couldn't have walked this way, uh, but at low tide, I can. So I'm coming up to that spit of land where I was standing before at high tide, and you can already see, hopefully, uh, that the water level is much lower than it was. All right, Potts Point, low tide. Water's all the way down there. And then if I go over to this other side, it's even more obvious. All of that, uh, all you could see this morning were the little edges of those rocks up above, and all of this was underwater. So all of this green algae here, all of that was underwater. We didn't see any of that this morning. Okay, um, so you can see this pool here is really dominated by the green algae, and then you see the brown algae uh, in those in those other areas. Um, that up there, that's that patch of uh, the marine grass that I was poking around in this morning, so that's where I'm going to head. Okay, I think that this was pretty close to where I was standing this morning. Um, so now it's low tide, and you can see, uh, especially as I turn this way, and you can see uh, behind me all of that mud flat that's exposed, all of those extra tide pools, um, and then as I turn back over to this side, you can start to see, uh, you can probably see some of the green algae areas, some of the brown algae areas, and then maybe even that eelgrass area. So let's go see what we can find. 
I think this is such a great example of why you have this uh, habitat heterogeneity, right? These little plants here, those root structures, are what's allowing all of that mud to stay here and collect and build that um, that muddy area. Without those plant roots, this all of this sediment and mud wouldn't collect. And so, when you see a big pile of seaweed like this, I just want you to have a sense for how much stuff there really is. Um, I'm going to try and pull all this away until we can get down to bare rock and you're seeing lots of different types of uh, brown algae, some red algae, uh, like that right there. Um, and what, else? what do we have? Finally we can get down to the bottom. Um, just there's a huge amount, huge um, physical volume or uh, amount of seaweed uh, in this area which provides the habitat and the structure for all of these other organisms. Oh, what a funny, what an interesting little row of barnacles here. There must be some benefit to being right in this little, almost crack on that rock. This is a different kind of snail. This is um, a dog whelk. Uh, one of the ways you can tell, so that little notch at the bottom of the shell there, uh, tells you that this is a carnivorous snail. It has sort of like a tooth that can come out of that little V and drill into um, other uh, animals. Um, and that's very different than these periwinkles that are uh, herbivores. They're just going to eat the, the algae, scrape the algae off the rocks and whatnot. Another, these big balls are another type of algae that we tend to see more at low tide. Usually these aren't um, visible at, at high tide. Here's another one of those. This is, that is another, this is another one of those uh, red algae that um, almost looks, has a structure almost more like a coral reef. It's sort of, it's got some uh, calcium carbonate in it that makes it structurally something or other. So now take a moment and think about what it would be like if you were a crab or a snail, um, and right now you are hunkering down, buried under some of this algae, um, but you might get exposed, you might dry all the way up. Uh, it's going to be another six hours before low tide, so for at least the next uh, few hours you are out of water, and then the tide comes in and fills up pretty much to, you know, maybe the level of my head or even higher. So that's just a huge change in the physical environment that any intertidal organism needs to deal with. Um, uh, two high tides, two low tides a day. So that is a, a change that is constantly happening. And so this adaptability and uh, really an amazing ability to withstand such different conditions. This, the outside of this seaweed looks fairly dry. As soon as I move it over, right? As soon as I move it over, you can tell that it's really damp underneath. So uh, this seaweed provides a really important service for all the crabs and snails and um, other little invertebrates under there because it keeps moisture and humidity really high. Even on a sunny day, even if it was 90 degrees out today, I would still be able to peel back just a little bit of the seaweed and find some of that oxygen, or sorry, find some of that water that these um, animals that hide under here at low tide need to survive. Uh, an ecologist might be walking around out here and wonder why this one area seems to be dominated by this green algae, right? All of this. So everywhere else around here that I've that I've been walking around, it's that that brown algae that's dominant. So um, I don't know the answer for this particular example, but that's the kind of question that an ecologist might want to know. There's got to be some reason why uh, this particular green algae seems to really be rocking it right here in this tide pool and nowhere else in this general area. So here you're seeing some of that. Uh, grass, that marine plant, and you're also seeing some of that brown algae. Um, this one's called uh, Ascophyllum, it's the genus, and an evolutionary biologist might wonder, might see that both of these photosynthetic organisms are long and skinny and have similar attachments at the rock, and might wonder uh, what uh, was it natural selection, what forces, you know, is there some sort of convergent evolution here that both of these organisms that sort of do a similar thing in the environment, be photosynthetic, attaching to um, the ground or the substrate, uh, is there a reason why they have that similar shape, uh, that similar morphology? 